Welcome back to Wordy Wednesday. Well, I've already had to restart this video because Audie was just all over me. So he's in the other room drinking from his water dish and let's hope he stays there for a while because he's in a mood. Well, today we're working on Ivanhoe, which is actually pretty good because We've had to give up Wordy Wednesday. That was one of the things that had to go when I cut back the video schedule. And recently in Wordy Wednesday, we've been talking about the history of the English language. And Walter Scott does deal with that. He deals with it completely inaccurately, but it is one of the themes in his book. So we're going to talk about that, plus a few more other things today when we come back. So, what's the deal with the language? Well, Walter Scott speaks about uh, the Anglo-Saxon language, English, the Norman language, French, and at times he actually writes that there was a lingua franca, a mix of the two, and he's very clear that his opinion is that modern English, which is what he certainly spoke, we know, we can read this, um, although he was writing 200 years ago, he believed that the language we speak today was the, uh, the descendant of a mixed language, a lingua franca, a mix between English and French. No, I'm sorry. Wally, boy, did you get it wrong. French has had very little impact on English. We have acquired a lot of vocabulary from French, but we also have words like sushi and kimono and uh, um, kaizen, that's one I use a lot. We have words from Japanese in our language, and no one would say Japanese had any profound impact on our language. Vocabulary interestingly enough, is one of the least significant aspects of a language. Our language, the modern English we speak today, was the result of, of Old Saxon, and that's what I'm going to call it because the language we speak is one of the six Old English languages. Ours is West Saxon. The reason it beat out the other five is simply because that was where the center of literacy was. So that was the one that was committed to paper, and that was the one that survived. It was largely impacted by Norse. That's our chief impact, another Germanic language, and that's the Scandinavian languages. It simplified our language, streamlined it, because the Norse traders that came over created a shorthand, a, a sort of oral shorthand, in order to make themselves understood. They dropped word endings, they left off conjugations, and that's why you will have uh, masculine or feminine or neuter nouns in other languages. We don't have them. Why? Because the Vikings couldn't sort it out. You know, and you'll have all kinds of elaborate conjugations. We have one. We have one little leftover. And that's the, um, the third person singular S. I walk, you walk, he, she walks, they walk, we walk, everybody walks. You know, what can you say? Uh, and that was because the Vikings just cut off anything they thought was superfluous, made themselves understood, and we liked it. The language that also had, and I don't want to say it was a major influence, but it was a significant one, 
is the Celtic languages. Celtic languages are also Proto-Indo-European, that's the overarching family of the European languages. Proto-Indo-European languages, Celtic, were not Germanic languages. So things like Welsh and Cornish and Manx, and those languages had a significant impact on us. Uh, I can say to you, I am speaking. And the reason that has a different meaning when, when you hear it than, for example, I speak, is because of the Welsh influence. So you can't even get through a sentence without hearkening back to that Welsh influence. It's like, seriously, try to get through your day without saying, I am doing whatever. It's almost impossible. Um, very minor in terms of size, very significant in terms of usage, uh, because frankly, English and the Celtic languages are the only languages on the planet in which you express a current action in terms of I am. Everywhere else it would be I speak. When we say I speak, we are not talking about what we are doing right now. And if we are, we are suggesting that there are times when we don't. For example, if I say I speak today, you're going to wonder if there are days when I don't speak because that's how we read that sentence because we have a different way of expressing it. So that was a, a, a significant, small, significant um, impact on our language. Um, I heard somewhere that we got like three words from Welsh, brat, baby, and I don't remember the third. Now, I also believe we got our DW words like dwarf, dwindle, dwell from the Celtic, but that's just my personal opinion. If I want to go get a doctorate in linguistics, maybe I'll do that for my dissertation. But it's just mine. Uh, so that is not some sort of imprimatur linguistic theory. I just believe that's where those words came from. Still, even if you throw in those three words, we're talking half a dozen words very, very minor contribution in terms of vocabulary. But take away I am doing. We're lost. We can't express ourselves, at least not the way we are accustomed to. So Scott was wrong. The French had very little impact on our language. They added vocabulary, and that's about it. But as I say, even the Japanese, who everyone can agree had no impact on the development of our language at all, have added vocabulary. So he was wrong about that. So let's take a look at a few other things he was wrong about because you cannot read this for history. Uh, when he speaks about Richard's time, and we know this book has a very narrow window in which it can be set. It had to be set between the time of Richard's captivity and the time at which he announced his return in London. That was a month. That month was between February 4th, 1194, and March 11th, 1194. Basically, the month of February. When he speaks about grandparents' generation being at uh, the time of the conquest, well, no, that was 130 years ago. Even in Walter Scott's time, 130 years was not merely hearkening back to his grandparents. Um, we are talking four, five, six generations earlier, keeping in mind that in the 12th century, the average life expectancy has been estimated to be somewhere between 30 and 35. Uh, more than half of the population was under 25. It was a world of children, which explains a lot when you consider the craziness they got into. 
there were virtually no mature people around. So even, by the way, in colonial America, knowing your grandparents was rare, very rare. Um, and at that point, we are talking only, say, 300 years ago because of life expectancy issues. And in colonial America, we had higher birth rates, a higher infant survival rate, and longer life expectancies than in the old world because there was more space, more food, um, just, well, you know, it was America, what can I say? But no, the truth is we had some tremendous advantages just geographically to enhance our life expectancies as Americans. And even then, grandparents, living grandparents were a rarity. So when his archer, Hubert, the forest warden, says, my grandsire drew a mighty bow in Hastings, no, he didn't. Your grandfather probably died at 32, and that was probably like three years ago. So, yeah, get over it. Uh, and there were many references to Hastings being in the popular mind at this time. No, 130 years was outside of human memory. In other words, no one alive would have remembered 130 years ago. Very few people alive would have had parents or grandparents of, uh, old enough to have told them about something going on 130 years ago. No, it, this was something that was just not in um, the memory of that generation. So that's one we need to toss aside. The other one we need to toss aside is Jews as the great moneylenders. And it surprises me that he would do this because he went hot and heavy after the Knights Templar. They were the great moneylenders. At one time, most of the, the financial transactions of a large scale were run within the Jewish community. Um, bills of mark from one congregation to another overseas, uh, they did move the money. At this point, no, it was the Knights Templar. Um, if someone recently described them as the first multinational corporation, and that's probably true in, in so many senses of the word. About 90% of the Knights Templars were not soldiers. They were monks, uh, accountants, really. And because the Knights Templar, because their mission was to safeguard the pilgrim routes from England to the Holy Land, they captured the popular imagination. People gave them vast sums of money. They would be mentioned in the wills of kings and queens and dukes and people who had money to give them. And they knew how to manage it. So they had over a thousand separate monasteries throughout Europe. And also, they were literate. Again, it's a bit of a novelty in these days. They would write out bill, which would transfer to another monastery, pay out the bill, just like we would write a check. Um, simple banking, but at the time, this was uh, just, it, it was beyond the scope of the average person whose mathematics was confined to their fingers. And they were able to do things like finance wars, finance a king's coronation, things like that. Uh, now, the Knights Templar, uh, they were founded in 1119. So we're at 1194. They're halfway through their life at this point because they were uh, officially suppressed in 1312. In France, 
when they were like physically put down, when they were all arrested. That was on October 13th, 1207. And that was a Friday. No, I'm sorry, 1307. I had that, had that wrong. 1307. It was Friday the 13th. And just as a little aside, um, this could be where our, our superstition about Friday the 13th comes from. Because in one day, they arrested virtually all of the Knights Templar in France. The reason they did it was because the king was so indebted to the Knights Templar for financing his wars and his everything and his opulent lifestyle that he was determined to get rid of them, thereby getting rid of his debt. So it's an order that lasted about 200 years, and they were Europe's moneylenders during that period. So when Sir Walter Scott says the Jews were the moneylenders, no, they might have been the moneylenders 100 years earlier, and they might have been the moneylenders again 100 years later. But in this narrow 200-year period, it was the Knights Templar, which is another example of the faulty history. And that's why you simply can't read this book thinking you're going to get history out of it. No. Um, I believe I also mentioned that there were virtually no Jews in England because Richard's first coronation, that was his real coronation, remember he had a second coronation when he came back from captivity, and that was um, in March of 1194. First coronation, um, the, the Jews of London wanted to gift him on his coronation. They wanted to give him things. Here's a coronation gift. And there was a great misunderstanding. Um, they were locked out. Uh, there was a riot. They were killed. Um, well, not all. Very nearly all of them were killed. The few that remained went into hiding. Um, and the Jews were not welcome in England. That was very clear at that point. So would there have been Jews in England in 1194? Well, if there were, they certainly wouldn't have announced it. They would not have gone around in Jewish garb, Middle Eastern garb. No, no, because they very likely would have been killed on the spot. And not being complete morons, they weren't going to do that. So, that's another piece of faulty history we have. Um, when I, I look at the overall picture, though, there are some things that he expresses really well. And these are things that we have trouble grasping as 21st century people. But he had much less difficulty in expressing as an early 19th century person, and he was capturing a time even before his. The whole idea of knightly glory and um, courtesy and that whole chivalric experience that Ivanhoe was all about, that, that romantic knight-errant thing, yeah, that was a big deal to them. Um, and that was absolutely a big deal to Richard. And we have to remember that, that Richard was not English. Uh, he was born in England, but he probably regarded that as a great misfortune. Richard was French. He, he had no interest in England. From his infancy, he was raised to be the heir of his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. His elder brother, uh, who was referred to as the young king, um, he, his, because he was also Henry, like his father. The young king was going to be king of England. Richard had no need to be jealous of his brother. England was a backwater province 
Richard was going to inherit Aquitaine. Aquitaine was not only about half of France, but it was the best and brightest half. This was the land of the troubadours and the minstrels and the poets and the sunshine. And yeah, this was just the center of Europe at that time. It was just glorious. It was an extremely rich land. And as I said, Richard had no need to envy his brother, none. He never saw himself as English. It's estimated that he spent between six and eight months in England as an adult. He, because uh, he was always off killing something. But when he wasn't killing something, he was in his mother's uh, province of Aquitaine. Um, his mother outlived him, uh, but his father did not because, of course, Richard helped to kill him. But it's a whole different story. And Richard was very likely gay. This is a widely disputed point. I do not base my belief that it's so on, like, the specious sort of reasoning of people who say, well, he shared a bed with the king of France. Yeah, but everybody shared beds in those days. A bed wasn't personal the way it is today. Now, a bed was just, you know, where people slept. And people in those days would have slept anywhere, on the floor, in a main hall. The idea that he, anybody would have shared a bed with somebody else meant nothing. Um, I base my belief on the fact that Richard made several public confessions about his unnatural uh, desires, you know, which would have been gay. Um, and his father hated homosexuality in a way that few people have before or since. It was made a capital crime in England. And of course, the church, and there was only one, the church uh, frowned on this. Um, it, it, was, it was a great sin. It was more than frowned on. Frowned on suggests that, you know, they might just look askance. Oh no, oh no, they condemned you to hell for this. And personally, I believe that was Richard's motivation for the Crusades, that he was attempting to get in good with God because he couldn't change who he was. And even if he tried, and I'm sure he did, that's what you did in those days, he wasn't going to be successful, so he was going to secure the Holy Land, which would get him out of hell. And that was his get out of hell free card. So, my personal opinion, I'm not the only one who believes he's gay, by the way. Um, also, he was married to Berengaria for something like nine years, and they had no children. Although, interestingly enough, there, uh, Richard allegedly had an illegitimate child and was known to commit acts of rape in time of war. But what we know today that people didn't really understand in the past is rape is not a crime of sex. Rape is a crime of violence clothed in sex. That, that's all. So does that mean he was not gay? I don't think so. Uh, an illegitimate child? Who knows who the child was? No DNA testing. So... That is not what I consider to be reliable evidence, especially since a man who would have been living under a death sentence if he were out of the closet might be very likely to acknowledge an illegitimate child just to get people off the scent, so to speak. So, my belief, Richard was gay. Um, and I think it's very well supported by the historical evidence. Was Richard English? <laughs> he would have been more likely to call himself a stray cat than to say, I am an Englishman. No, he was French. And he, he was a southerner at that, from the south of France. And that was how he saw himself. So 
what we have here is a myth of Richard that is created by Walter Scott and has pretty much gone unchallenged uh, to the modern times. Uh, we also have the myth of Robin Hood that comes from this. Uh, the, the influence of this book is really hard to overestimate because there were just so many, um, just so many things that have come to us from this, uh, the whole concept of Jewish moneylenders. Well, most of us would be inclined to say, yeah, but I get that from Shakespeare. Yeah, true enough. He got it from Shakespeare too, and he ran with it. Um, the Knights Templar. Again, Walter Scott wrote about them. Very few people did. So we have all of our Knights Templar myths, that they were all just errant knights wandering around looking for battle. No, 90% of them were accountants. Um, we, we get our concepts of 12th century England from Scott and not from reality. So... That's why it behooves us to take a good look at this, to read it, to process it, and to pick apart the history. So my caveat to all of you is don't take anything at face value. The history is so flawed. Right down to, oh, and they're going to have a tournament in England in February. No, they weren't. You know, Richard just wandering the countryside saying, I shall fight for good Englishmen. No. Remember, Richard is the guy who said he would gladly sell all of England if he could just find someone dumb enough to buy it from him. It was a source of revenue for his crusades. He had, he became king by accident. He had two dead older brothers. That's how he became king. It was never on his agenda. And he was never going to give up the Aquitaine. Never. Richard and Eleanor, his mother, were very close. Um, and, uh, by the way, that's not why I think he was gay, but what can I say? Let's throw the stereotype in there. Um, he and his mother were very close. They, Richard was her favorite, no question. He supported his mother against his father. Um, the relationship between the two was so well known that the first thing that happened when Henry II, Richard's father, when his death was known in England, was Eleanor, who had been locked away for plotting against him, because the whole family plotted against him, was immediately released. Her jailers put her out uh, like as fast as blinking because they knew that Richard was king, and they had better treat his mother well. And Richard relied heavily on his mother for advice and support. Um, so it was a good, solid, close relationship. He was his mother's son. And it was, after all, Eleanor of Aquitaine. So he was, in a very real sense, Richard of Aquitaine, not Richard of England. So, with all of that thrown out here, um, the, the chivalric parts, and I started just to talk about that, that is well done. We have trouble relating to this. You know, the glory of fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, we consider that rather seamy and, you know, drunken bar fight sort of behavior. They reveled in it. They really did. And remember, they were a very young world. Um, it, they were, for the most part, teenagers. Um, Richard died at 41, by the way. So, and he was considered, you know, rather elderly. The life expectancies were short. The people were young. And they had that same sort of 
juvenile bravado that we see among teenagers. So they love this sort of thing. We have a hard time relating. Scott did not. He was not far enough past that mentality to find it as incomprehensible as we do. So he does a very good job of explaining that, translating it to us, if you will. Um, as I said before, Rebecca is the heroine who comes out um, resonating strongly with us in the 21st century. She was intelligent. She was independent. She was kind. Um, Rowena, Rowena was sort of a pale, you know, the 93rd carbon copy sort of thing. She would have been the ideal heroine in Scott's day. Um, you know, tepid and, uh, and submissive and crying and whatever. So he was locked in his own times in some ways. In some ways, he garbled the history pretty badly. In other ways, he took what was history for him, put it into a context that we as future generations can find comprehensible. And there are times when I, I think, for example, with Rebecca, I don't think he had any idea how strongly that character would resonate in the 21st century. He threw her out there and said, here you go. And as I say, I don't, I don't think he could have comprehended the way we would look at this now. So, well worth the read. We're going to continue on with this. In the comments, let me know how far you've gotten and if you're enjoying it. As I say, it is a classic. It's something that it's on the list of things we should read. Um, and we have to throw some in there because we're not doing Middlemarch. I hate Middlemarch, and I don't care how many people think it's the finest novel in the English language. I think it's crap. So, no, no Middlemarch. So we got to do something to make up for that. All right, I will see you all tomorrow morning. And we're going through the weekend, and we, I have a special surprise for you all on Project Sunday. Plus, we are going to do a bunch of giveaways this weekend. So, stay tuned, and I will see you then. <laughs>